go ahead and yeah. grab our Bibles and open to First Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter two. I guess I'd better get in the right book, huh? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you again for the gift of your word, for the, for the gift of your spirit, that he guides us into all truth, that he brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus said. And we're grateful for Paul and your revelation through him to us, uh, giving us so many of these principles by which we are to live in, in helping us to, to know how to live a godly life. And so help us to see you this morning and, and help us to, um, to tune our hearts um, that we may praise you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we began in chapter 1 and we see Paul. Um, he, he's coming down to, to the end. And so because he's coming down to the end, he is focusing on what Timothy needs to know uh, for the day when Paul is no longer going to be around. And so we see lots of imperatives, lots of um, Paul's message has changed somewhat in that uh, he is, there's much more of a focus in the book of 2 Timothy on suffering, on suffering hardship. There is much more emphasis on enduring. There is emphasis on um, difficulty and, and, and carrying on in the face of difficulty. And so we saw that last week in, in chapter one. In fact, as chapter one is ending, uh, Paul is beginning, he's, he's, he's encouraging Timothy to not be ashamed to not be ashamed of the gospel, to not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, to not be ashamed of Paul and Paul's suffering for the name of Christ, uh, encouraging him, admonishing him, retain the standard of sound words which you have learned from me. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. So last week, uh, as he's writing, we see that he is encouraging Timothy directly. Timothy, this is what you need to value the truth that has been given to you. You need to treasure the truth and you need to guard it. You need to defend it so that it is, uh, it is taught accurately, that it is lived accurately. And he ends the chapter with just a it's, a, it's a statement of fact. You know that all for, who are from Asia turned away from me. And he names, uh, you know, Phygelus and Hermogenes. But then he also points out, but then at the same time, there was Onesiphorus, who um, Timothy knows from Ephesus, because that's where Onesiphorus is from. And Onesiphorus came to Rome, looked for Paul, diligently searched him out, and, and found him and encouraged him and helped to, uh, to serve Paul there. And so, let's begin here now in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. You therefore, my son, and this is on the heels again of uh, the turning away by those from Asia and... Um, and yet Onesiphorus still not being ashamed. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That is a nice theme sentence for a paragraph. And the idea here, the word for be strong, comes from the same word, we saw this word last week, dunamis, from which we get our word, Dynamite. It's talking about power. And so this idea here of being strong is be empowered. Now the reason that it says be strong, be empowered, is that it's in the passive voice. This is something that's being done to Timothy. This is something that God is doing 
for Timothy. And something that we need to realize is that when it comes to the, to the idea of grace, that is something that God does for us. That is not something that we drum up on our own. Remember in Hebrews uh, 4.15, it talks about boldly approaching the throne of grace, right? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That grace comes from God. It is supplied by God. And so Timothy is to allow himself to be strengthened and to be empowered by God's grace. That is something that Timothy is to give himself over to. Now, this idea of giving yourself over to, does that tickle, does that bring anything to your mind? that where Paul has issued words like that before. Go ahead, your head's nodding. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, exactly. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't give yourself over to the dominion and the control of alcohol. Don't give up dominion in that way. Rather, give yourself over to the dominion and the control of the Holy Spirit. It's the same type of thing here. And Paul is using this terminology specifically because remember, he is trying to, he's trying to light a fire under Timothy. Timothy by nature appears to have been uh, somewhat withdrawn. He's not a guy who walks into a party and takes over the room. He's not the kind of guy to walk into the church by nature and assert on behalf of the gospel or on behalf of the truth to go in and to powerfully confront, powerfully yet at the same time gently, kindly, with patience as we're going to see here later in this, in this chapter. Paul is one of those who, he is a champion for trumpeting the truth that God's grace is always what? Sufficient, yes. It's always sufficient. Timothy, you need to remember that. There are things, again, that P Timothy needs to be drawing to his mind to remember reality. And again, for us, uh, there are times that are very difficult. We've had some rough times here over the last year and a half here, right? Just with all the, uh, do we meet? Do we not meet? How do we respond to the government when the government makes different demands? Uh, you know, there's, those are things that everybody, we all have to work through because it's kind of new ground. There are some things that really haven't been pushed before. There are buttons that haven't been pushed. There are boundaries that haven't been tested. And so as we're going through that, we need to keep in mind that God's grace, the power that we need in order to live a godly life is always sufficient, always. And so Paul is gonna use four examples of how that plays out. So verse two. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Timothy, you're to teach. And you're to teach the truth. You don't water it down. You don't cut it. You don't change it. It's not yours to change. It is yours. You have been entrusted with this treasure. You are to treat it as a treasure. And you're to find men like you, men who are faithful, men who will carry the baton. Paul is passing that baton to Timothy. The day is going to come when Timothy is going to be where Paul is right now. There's going to become an end to Timothy's ministry. And Timothy, you don't wait till the last minute. You start this process now. You, you, you take the truth, you identify faithful men, and you pass this on to him. Now, my dad was sometimes rather colorful um, in his analogies. And I can remember being a teenager and dad coming in one day and we were talking 
And he was encouraging me to not just be a spiritual sponge. And he used a term. When you have someone who just simply takes in and never sends out, never gives out from that, you become spiritually constipated. Now, think about that for a moment. God has never intended any single one of us to simply be one who gathers knowledge. What are we to do with what we learn? Each and every one of us was commissioned to preach the gospel. And again, and, and one of the things that I appreciate about the teaching here over years is that the gospel is not simply the, the message of how one can be made right with God. The gospel incorporates everything that comes to godly living. It incorporates all of that. And so the things that we learn, we are then to pass along. Most of us are parents, and so we have a built-in audience. We're to be passing that along to our kids. You're to be passing it on to, to younger, the, the older guys. We're passing it on to younger men. You older women, you're passing those things along to younger women. And so the idea here is, Timothy, you're to be a teacher. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, we find um, in Hebrews chapter 6, uh, the admonition by the, by the author of Hebrews, by now, you should have been teachers. You should be mature enough that you would be able to communicate truth to those who need to learn it, and yet, you're not there because you're not, com you're not mature enough. You still to me need learning the elementary principles of the gospel. We're not to be that way. So the emphasis of being a teacher, the emphasis there is on the content of what is being taught and passing that along is the education of others. And so, Timothy, that's one way in which you are going to turn this, uh, you are going to be strong in your ministry. Focus on truth and communicating that truth. Then second, second example, verse three. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, Paul likes the analogy of soldiers, right? Go back to Ephesians. Again, a book written to this church. And it, he, he talked about you have all of the armor of God. And using the analogy here of here's a soldier, here are the things that the soldier has as his equipment for the carrying out of the job that he has. Now being a soldier in those days was probably not any easier than being a soldier today. When you have a soldier, uh, we've had Three sons serve in the military. We've had a Marine, we've had a soldier, we have a sailor now. All three of them got to experience changes to their itinerary, and those changes to their itinerary, be it here in the States or be it when they were deployed, were, was for what reason? The needs of the service. Something comes up. Uh, we had a son who was uh, on a fast attack submarine, and his tour got extended because something came up and we need you in a particular place and it's gonna take time for you to get there, it's gonna take time for you to be there for the reason that we are sending you there and it's gonna take time to get home. Uh, sometimes that service is not easy. Um, on his last deployment, uh, it was during COVID, they spent 138 days straight submerged. They did not see the sun for four and a half months. Now, I personally cannot even imagine that. And, and yet, that is the needs of the service. And then when you're a soldier, it is about your duty. 
And it is about paying whatever price that you have to pay. You look at pictures, uh, uh, Korea, the frozen chosen. Our soldiers in wintertime conditions without necessarily wintertime supplies. Valley Forge, the Battle of the Bulge. You know, all of these are wintertime. And so you have all the, all the extra privation of the elements in addition to actually combat and all the other things there with being a soldier. And so, and when you have a soldier who's on active duty, what does his focus need to be? It needs to be about his duty. And so, and I know again, as I'm looking around the room, I know some of you have served. I know that some of you have had family members that have served. You get this. His, his focus needs to be on duty. And therefore, you don't concentrate on some of the other things that you and I, who are not in that position, we get to do. Because you need to be focused on your duty. Timothy, you're not a reservist. You don't do this a weekend, a month, and two weeks during the summer. What's the term that gets used with that, by the way? And it's somewhat, sometimes a derogatory term. The weekend warrior. Timothy, that's not you. You're a frontline guy. So act like one. So the emphasis with the soldier, you do what you need to do in order to be able to fulfill your duty, to accomplish your task. He continues on. Verse five, also if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Now again, another example that Paul's used before, right? When he was writing to the Corinthians. I, therefore, I beat my body and, and make it my slave so that when I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. And so the athlete, why does the athlete compete? He runs to what? To win. Therefore, because he's going to run to win, you know, the, the race begins long before the, the gun goes off, right? You're doing all the training that's coming up beforehand. And so you're training because you have a goal in mind. It affects everything that you do, but you have to compete lawfully. Uh, there was somebody ran, running the Boston Marathon, I think it was, who didn't actually run the whole race, right? They jump in at the last, you know, with a couple of miles to go. And then that, do, 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 and they go through and, and, and they caught them because they can go through and go, hey, wait a minute, who are you? You haven't shown up in any of the aid stations, you know, throughout the whole race. You didn't actually run the race. So therefore, you are disqualified. You don't cut corners. You have to compete according to the rules. Timothy, same thing applies to you. You follow the rules. Timothy, you do not have the ability to change the message. What a temptation that must be when all of a sudden uh, suffering is not hypothetical. It's real. And why is it coming? Because it's about the message. So if you change the message, then perhaps people won't hate you like they're going to if you're faithful to the truth. They hated Jesus without a cause, right? And what did Jesus tell the disciples? They hated me. They're going to hate you. And that was carried out in reality, wasn't it? Carried out in history. How many of the disciples died a natural death? According to tradition, one, the Apostle John. And that was after being boiled in oil, by the way. 
So John didn't have easy street. None of them did. Same is going to be true, by the way, of Timothy. Timothy heeded all of these admonitions from the Apostle Paul. Tradition has it that he was still ministering in Ephesus and there was uh, a disturbance. He stood up to proclaim truth and he was beaten to death for his troubles. So again, Timothy, run by the rules. Don't change the message. Compete lawfully. Then again, verse 6, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Now, farmers in that day typically worked alone. And there's, anybody in here look at farming as a, a really high calling in life? That, that, that's, that's a vocation that I truly aspire to, being a farmer. Most guys who are farmers, they were born into it, especially dairy farmers. You don't see somebody, you know, who doesn't come from an agricultural uh, background waking up one day and going, I think I'd like to be a dairy farmer and get up, you know, in the middle of the night to make sure I can milk cows. That typically doesn't happen. So the farmer works and he works hard. It is difficult labor. Day, night, rain, sleet. I mean, this guy, he's got it more difficult than the postal service when it comes to, to going through because the postman gets a paycheck. The farmer doesn't get a paycheck until he's actually harvesting crops. That's when he gets paid. So Timothy, the idea here is your work is not in vain. Now, it may not be in money. If you're a pastor, it's, your reward is almost assuredly, if you're a faithful pastor, it's not going to be money. Your reward is going to be seeing fruit for your labor. You know, I'm looking here at two men who have dedicated their lives to the church. Um, and they're, they're, they're kind of, they're, they're not nodding up and down. Um, but uh, I know that they didn't get rich off of the gospel. They didn't get rich off of their service to the church. And so again, Timothy, you're going to work, you're going to work hard, but there is going to be a reward. You may not see it in this life. Hopefully you will be able to get glimpses of it in this life. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And so Timothy, again, the call here is suck it up and be faithful to your calling. Fulfill your ministry. And he's to do it with loyalty. Verse 8, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, uh, you'll remember, for to me to live is Christ. That was who Paul was. And, and that's the emphasis of his life now, isn't it? When you go to 2 Corinthians and you, and you look at him talking about the different things that he has suffered for the name of Christ, beaten five times, beaten three times with rods, being shipwrecked, all of the different privations that he suffered directly for the gospel. Some of which, by the way, he didn't have to do. Now you'll remember in Jerusalem, 
when he was in with the Sanhedrin and they're about to throw a riot and the Romans come in and they rescue him and they're trying to figure out what's going on and so the Romans had a way, they had a means of gathering information from people who were suspects and that was, well we're going to interview you with scourging. Hi, we're going to beat you and we're going to beat the truth out of you. And you'll recall that Paul, you know, says to the centurion, are you going to beat me, a Roman citizen who has not been condemned? And that gets the centurion's attention, right? Because that's illegal. And in fact, it's illegal in a really bad way for the centurion if he carries that through. Now, this is when Paul is in Jerusalem after his third missionary journey. Go back to his second missionary journey when he has gone to Philippi for the first time. And what happens to Paul in Philippi when he's there the first time? Say it louder. He's beaten, right? He and Silas are beaten and thrown in jail. Was that a lawful beating? And you know that by the response of the city authorities when all of a sudden the city authorities find out these guys are Romans. We just messed up badly. And you'll remember that here they are, they're, they're, in, the Philipp they're in the Philippian jail, they've been cared for by the Philippian jailer uh, after all the other stuff that was going on. Uh, with the angel and the doors opening and all of that. And the city officials are terrified. And so they, want, they send word, release those men. And Paul says, no dice. You beat us, you come down here and deal with this in person. And they did, right? They show up because they're at risk. So you've got to ask the question, Somewhere in there, don't you? Why did Paul take the beating? He did it in Philippi. He didn't do it in Jerusalem. Same situation. Now you might think that, and, and, and there's not an answer given in Scripture, by the way. I suspect that in Jerusalem, there was no point to him taking that beating in front of the Sanhedrin. They had already killed Stephen. They had already sentenced many others to death. And so the idea that someone was willing to die for the gospel, oh, well, they're already ready. They're plenty familiar with that. They've had that happen many times already. But in Philippi, the gospel's just gotten there. Paul's going to take one for those people to show them you need to be willing to suffer for the truth. Being a Christian isn't easy. As he's going to tell Timothy here, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. When Paul got stoned at Iconium, and he goes on to Derby, where Timothy lives and then comes back through. He goes back through Iconium, the place where they just stoned him and left him for dead. And what's his message? Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul's willing to take that and take it personally. Painful, you know, the pain and everything that goes along. So, Timothy, as I am telling you these things, you know yourself. I'm not telling you, I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't done myself. Suffer with me. Suffer hardship with me. So, Paul doesn't look through rose-colored glasses. He's not trying to sell Timothy something. He's not selling him snake oil. You need to understand what it's going to cost. Timothy, you've already seen it. Timothy was with Paul in Philippi when Paul and Silas were beaten. 
He just didn't get pulled into it. And so, Timothy, you already know what these things are like. You've seen them. So your eyes need to be open, but you still need to fulfill your ministry. And so, suffer with me. You remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, the one who has conquered death, the one who is the Messiah. He's the promised one. He's the anointed one. And I'll suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. Paul's not a criminal. Not in the sense of violating God's law. He's a criminal as far as Rome is concerned because he won't kowtow to the Roman version of truth. Remember in Rome, uh, Caesar, was, Caesar was to be worshiped as God. And that was the, the telltale in Rome when you got a Christian. Are you gonna say those words, Caesar ho curios? Caesar is Lord. And the Christians, those who were faithful, no. There's only one Lord, and that's Jesus. And so, suffer imprisonment even to be to this treatment. But notice where Paul goes. The word of God is not imprisoned. And so remember that here he is. Uh, this is at a point where this is, this is close arrest. This isn't house arrest. And so he's being guarded. Uh, he's chained to a Roman soldier. And Paul does not throw a pity party. Paul looks at this and goes, I have a captive audience. This guy can't get away from me. Amazing how perspective can alter your view of your circumstances. Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Again, this idea of being ashamed, of being embarrassed, of being one who pulls back. You know, you don't want to have association with somebody or something because somehow it's, it's shameful. Timothy, you don't view that when it comes to the gospel. Nor do you view it with your performance in your service. You be diligent about your handling of the truth. You protect the integrity of the truth. So that as you are going through and you are teaching the principles of godliness, you're doing it accurately so that in the day when you stand before God, he looks and he's going to say, you know what? Good job. Well done. Good and faithful servant. If you do things the way, you see, if you run, if you serve as the soldier should serve, and you run according to the rules as the athlete, and you're diligent in your duties as the farmer, and you're diligent in your duties with protecting the truth and teaching the truth, you have no reason to be ashamed. You may be vilified by men, and chances are you will be, but you will not stand ashamed before your God. And so, Timothy, be diligent in your study. Uh, you remember um, in 1 Timothy, pay close attention to yourself, to your own pursuit of personal holiness. Pay close attention to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for in so doing, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. And so, Timothy, be diligent.
handle the truth rightly, and again, the idea here, accurately handing, handling the word of truth, is the idea of cutting something straight. Paul's a tent maker, and if you, have a, if you can't cut your material straight, then it's gonna be difficult to put everything together and have a product that accomplishes its purpose and is you know, attractive enough, right? You don't wanna have a tent that looks like it's made out of a bunch of towels. It might accomplish the purpose, but who's gonna to wanna to buy it? And so, cut it straight. One of the things that's gonna happen, Timothy, if you're gonna be diligent about preserving the truth, then you also need to turn away from those things that are error. So, verse 16, avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. I did not know this until studying this passage. Do you know that gangrene is a Greek word? It is literally a trans... A trans uh, Transliteration, thank you, honey. It's a transliteration. Gangreno is the Greek word. What's gangrene? Yeah, rot. And when it is present, number one, spreads incredibly quickly. Number two, requires drastic action if you're gonna save the life of the person who has it. Which usually means either amputation or they're gonna die. And so that idea here of that is what error, that is what false teaching is. It's gangrene, it's like cancer, but it's a cancer that is quickly spreading and very lethal. So this isn't something to, uh, you know what, it really doesn't matter. What matters more is that we all get along and that we're all friendly toward each other and we tolerate um, in, the, in the social sense of that word. We are very tolerant of people who have different views of truth and who will espouse different views of truth. How many views of truth are there? There's one. A different view of truth means that there is going to be introduction of error. And that is not, Timothy, you do not foster that. You hold on to what is true. You don't entertain error at all. In Timothy, you be willing to pay any price. Verse 10, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. Paul before has said, I, I will become all things to all men, right? Timothy actually underst should understand this. Timothy had a Greek, excuse me, had a Jewish mother, but a Greek father. And when he came to Christ and he became associated with the Apostle Paul, what did Paul have Timothy undergo as an adult? Circumcision. Ouch. Why did Paul have Timothy circumcised? because Timothy's, Timothy's mom was a Jew. To avoid offending the Jews, Timothy got circumcised. Paul did not have Titus circumcised. Titus was a Gentile. And so again, Timothy, you need to buy into this idea that I am willing to endure hardship adversity, pain, if it's going to further the message. If it is gonna make it to where I can reach another person, and I have no idea. The pastors here 
in this church have no idea who the chosen are. It's not like you're walking around with an E on your forehead because I'm elect. There's no way to know that. But we do know that if we are faithful in proclaiming the truth, when those people come across our path, they're going to hear the truth, and that'll be the instrument by which God saves them. So again, what are Timothy? You need to be willing to endure any hardship on behalf of the elect, just as I do. So again, there's an example. I actually went back in there, didn't I? Thank you for not jumping up out of your seats and going, why did you go back? <laughs> I thought we got through there. Now, Paul names names here, too. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Now, Hymenaeus, he got named in 1 Timothy. So apparently, Hymenaeus has not gotten the message that, dude, you're preaching error. You need to stop. You need to straighten up and fly right. You need to come back to the truth and teach the truth. Otherwise, you're not a pastor. Frankly, you're not a Christian. You're an enemy. You're a false teacher. And notice that the issue that they're, they're dealing with They've gone astray from the truth, and how did they do it? The resurrection has already taken place. Now, it's not for sure known exactly what they were teaching there. It is possible that what they're teaching is um, Jesus has already come back, and, and now we're in this other phase of, of life. What's the consequence of their error? They're upsetting. They're overturning the confidence and the faith of some. You know what? I skipped a whole section, and we need to go back for a moment. I apologize. Because I missed the eternal, the, the, oh, Dave, how did you refer to this the other day? Um, the, the epitome texts? Epitomizing text. Epitomizing text. Thank you. Because here's one of them. It is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now, this is a little bit of a problem passage. Because there's, how do you interpret this? How do you, how do you view this? Because you've got two things there in 12b, and 13 that appear to be contradictory. So, what this is contrasting is loyalty and disloyalty. That's the contrast here. And it's, it's using um, parallelism. And so he begins with, when you're loyal, this is what it looks like. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. And again, even this one, I think that what he's getting at here, there's a couple of different interpretations of this. This is the idea, remember Paul's example of what baptism is? Baptism is a, is a, a demonstration of we are dead to sin, we are buried with Christ in baptism so that we may be raised to newness of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 6. And so, if we've died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. So, if we are loyal to Christ, then we live with him, we reign with him. But there's another side to that coin. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And that word deny is disown, 
It is, I'm choosing to have nothing to do with him. Now, immediately what jumps into your mind when you talk about somebody denying Jesus? Who, who comes to mind? Peter. Did Peter deny Jesus? Did he deny that he had anything, that he knew him? Did he deny that he had anything to do with him? Yes, he did. In a moment of abject cowardice. Remember who's doing the accusing. Probably the most helpless person in, Rome, in, in society. A servant girl. And what was Peter's immediate response to getting called out for it? He denies Jesus three times, just as Jesus told him he was going to do, right? And he, he does it the third time. The cock crows, Luke says, and Jesus turned and looked at Peter. And what does Peter do? He goes out and he weeps bitterly. He had just proclaimed that that would never happen. And he did it not once, he did it three times. Was Peter cast aside by Jesus? No, he was not. So the idea here of denying, the, the word is used, it's in the indicative. If we deny, that word denies in the future, middle, indicative. So it's not a one-time failure. This is a person, this is probably more along the lines of, in the parable of the sower and the seeds and the soils, that um, you have response to where, you know, something pops up, but all of a sudden when the heat comes and you have persecution or you have, you know, being choked out by the, by the treasures of this world and the pleasures of this world, and then some, it either scorches or it withers out and dies, that person wasn't redeemed to begin with. Because what is the characteristic of one who is truly redeemed? What do they do? They endure. They stay at it. That's a sign of being truly redeemed. And so this is, pers this is somebody who probably, this is uh, gonna be along the lines of Hebrews 6. Someone who has tasted of the goodness of the Lord and then turned away. And so don't, you know, and, and for us there, um, look, being a Christian is not praying a prayer and now I've got my fire insurance and I can just live however I wish. That's not being redeemed. Being redeemed is, I have turned away, you know, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And so, you know, when a person who is redeemed, it's no longer about me, it is about Christ. The idea here, if we deny him, he will also deny us. What did Jesus say? If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. That's pretty plain. If we are faithless, here's where the controversy comes as to how to deal with, with the issue of denial. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Now. What is the way that that is typically understood? Yeah. In the end, we're forgiven. Jesus is going to cover us there. That's not what it's getting at. Because the idea, when you, when you take that interpretation, what is Jesus being faithful to? Okay, 
see, now here's where he's either being faithful to me and, you know, covering for me, or he is being faithful to himself and his own nature. Jesus cannot act contrary to his nature. That's what it's getting at here. He is still faithful. He won't deny himself, meaning that on the day of judgment, if I am in a position of rebellion against him, then I, I'm not going to be able to get mercy. There won't be mercy in that day for me. I have chosen to reject him. And so the idea here is he's going to be faithful to his own nature. Now, is Jesus faithful? I don't want to, uh, you know, we don't want to disregard 1 John 1, 9, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, that is for the one who is repentant and the one who is redeemed. That is not for the one who is continually rebellious. Did, was Judas sorry for what he had done in betraying Jesus? Yes, he was. Was he repentant? No, he was not. All right, let's see if I can get back on track here. So you have Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who are teaching error, and they upset the faith of some. Verse 19, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. Number one, the Lord knows who are his. If you're elect, you will not be deceived in such a way that you fall away from the truth. Remember Jesus talking about uh, in the final days, there's going to be a lot of error that is presented as truth. And he makes the statement that uh, it's going to be deceitful and it's going to be widespread deception and it's going to be effective to a point. Many are going to be deceived and if those times were not cut short, maybe even the elect might be, but they won't be because they're kept by him. The Lord knows who are his and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. So again, I can have confidence in Christ. I can have confidence in his promises to me as a child of his. But there is also, uh, it's not just I'm, I'm receiving. It is also there is to be a change in me in that I no longer pursue the things that are wicked and the things that are evil. And then he goes to verse 20. And he talks about different vessels. You've got some that are gold. You've got some that are silver. Those ten, if you have something of gold and something that's of silver, what are those typically going to be used for? Those are usually for show, right? Are you really going to use something made of gold or something made of silver to empty the ashes from the kitchen? No, you're not going to do that. There are more common vessels available for that. So you have now in a large, ve in a large house, there are not only gold and silver, ves silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, some to honor, some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, and the idea here of these things, that's going back up to everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness, going back to accurately handling the word of truth and being faithful to the truth and to being faithful to the gospel. 
If anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. If you want to be a useful vessel, you need to act in such a way that makes you useful for the master. Because again, if I'm preaching error, I'm not useful to Christ. I'm in opposition to him because I'm teaching his truth something that he has called falseness. falseness. He's called it false. And so how do you demonstrate that again? And he, he, he goes back into something that frankly he, he's told Timothy before. You flee from youthful lusts. You run away from these temptations over here. You're not passive in that. You actively get away from these types of temptations. And instead of pursuing after that, you pursue righteousness and love and faith and peace. So again, uh, we, we talked earlier about uh, Ephesians 5. Don't give yourself over to the, to the domination of these things. Give yourself over to the domination of the Spirit. In this case here, that, be, that domination, that's passive. That's something that happens to me. This is active because this is me actually pursuing those things. And so you, you give up pursuing the things that you would do when you're young and you're ignorant. Timothy, you may be young, but you're not ignorant anymore because I've taught you what is true. So you, give, you, you forget chasing these other things. Timothy, you set aside the entanglements of everyday life because you are a soldier on active duty. You be about fulfilling your duty. And you chase after those things because those things, you're, you're doing that. It's a demonstration. You're one of those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. This idea of refuse, it's to reject, it's to have nothing to do with. Those are two other ways that very word is used. And how is it always used? Reject. That's from Titus. Three, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. The idea of having nothing to do with, again, when you know that something is wrong, you don't embrace it, you don't play with it, you have nothing to do with it. It just produces quarrels. And quarrels is the idea of combat. It's personal. It's back and forth fighting. Same word used in James 4, you know, what is the cause of quarrels among you? Here people, they are at odds with each other. And why? Because they both want something and frankly they want it at the expense of the other. You avoid those things that are foolish and ignorant. The speculations, speculations is the idea of, it's, it's philosophical, it's hypothetical, and more, it's more about just words. It's an exchange of words rather than an actual search for truth. The issue isn't actually finding out what's right, it's just we're, we're bantering about, uh, you know, whatever the subject may be. It's not something that's needed. It's not something that's edifying. It's not something that is helpful. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. You don't win a fight by being pugnacious. If you're gonna represent the truth, you win by being kind, you win by being patient. You win by being gentle. You don't beat somebody over the head with the truth. That doesn't mean you can't be direct and admonish them. But it's always in the, in the, it's always in the sense of trying to win them. 
And we need to close, but here, here's the point here behind this. The Lord's modern servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Here's the part. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been, having been held captive by him to do his will. What's he getting at? When you are sharing the truth, when you are teaching the truth, when you are preaching the truth, it is not about you. It is not about how persuasive you are. It is not about how eloquent you are. It is not about you having exactly the right word. That isn't true when it comes to preaching the gospel to our kids. We don't save our kids. We are to be faithful in proclaiming the truth and we are to be faithful in living the truth before them. But the fact of the matter is, their salvation is not within my power, nor is repentance within my power. Repentance is something that is occurring in the heart. I don't have the ability to go in and change someone's heart. And so, be encouraged. That's why I need to be about preaching God's message in God's way which is patiently, just as God has been patient with me. It is kindly, it is gently, it is trying to win someone, not beat them over the head. And at the end of the day, I can do those things and I can be patient even when I am maligned because God is the one who's gonna do it or not. That's God's territory. If I try to take that on myself, if you try to take that on yourself, that that is on you, what's that gonna to lead to? Oh, you're gonna be frustrated. You're gonna become discouraged. Frankly, you'll probably become despairing. Why is it that these people aren't turning? Now, if they're not turning because there's, you're not being faithful to the text, well, that's on you. And if they're not, if, 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 if you are somehow an impediment to the message, well, that's a problem. You need to deal with that. But proclaim the message of truth and do it God's way. God's the one who's, who's going to open blind eyes. We're not eye surgeons. That's God's business. We're not heart surgeons. That's God's business too. He uses us and he uses our service. But ultimately, those are things that God does himself. Questions? We haven't had very much back and forth this morning, have we? All right, let's pray. Father, how grateful we are that in fact, you work in the hearts of men and women. You've done that in our hearts. And you've done it in the hearts of many. And we are grateful. We are grateful for your word in which we can, uh, we can read it in our own language. You give us your spirit so that we have insight and understanding and we can have wisdom. Lord, help us to be those who fear you in every way, shape, and form, that we would be far more concerned with your majesty, your glory, you being revealed to a world that's blind, a world that doesn't know you because it can't. So Lord, help us to be consumed with the idea of proclaiming your word and living it in being uh, living sacrifices for you. Thank you so much that you give us everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. We lack nothing. And so help us to be faithful. Help us to be faithful to you. As we've read today, um, that, we would be, that we would die with you so that we may live with you. 
that we would be faithful to you, that we may reign with you. Lord, help us to never reach that point where we outlive our love for you. In Jesus' name, amen.